Hi, hey, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Sheer. Yes, tonight's going to be amazing Sheer. Somebody just texted me amazing Sheer tonight. Yes, it will be much Hashem. Tonight is Sheer 100. Sheer, I was called Sheer. Tonight's Sheer is 110. And uh, we'll get into that. It's 110 Sheerim. Again, I want to start off every week with thanking everybody for, for coming and promoting it. The platform where Hashem is exploding. As you know, everybody posted on the WhatsApp statuses and they send it around to their friends and they let people know about it. As we call it, Sichas Chaverim over here and everybody's machazik each other. So Baruch Hashem, we're holding where we're holding here. If anybody wants to join the, the WhatsApp every Sunday, I send out the flyers. You can WhatsApp me at 848-525-0066. Again, that's 848-525-0066. And I'll send you the flyer every Sunday. If not, you can go to menachembernfeld.com. You can sign up to get his flyers, the replays. I'll get the Zach from Menachem, menachembernfeld.com. Anybody who's watching this later on YouTube, you can click on the like button, the subscribe button. And every Monday, 2.30, 2 a.m., Menachem uploads it, and you can get the sharing from that week. I want to thank, first of all, our advertising sponsors, the Lakewood School here for promoting it on Lakewood, Robin Yenit from Chazak for promoting it on the Chazak channels, Ellie and Ariel from Five Town Central, and a special thank you to Chaya Lekal from Shmuel Summer from JCN, the Jewish Content Network for promoting it on all the digital Jewish platforms. The Coach Menachem Show is collaborating with OK Clarity to bring greater health and wellness to the Jewish community. OK Clarity is an online platform for mental health support to the Jewish community. And OK Clarity, you find some of the best therapists, coaches, nutritionists, engaged in forms. Menachem will send it out in the link. Again, if anybody's here the first time, um, every Sunday night at 9.30 on this Zoom ID, we have tremendous shirum, tremendous topics of rabbanim, therapists. Sometimes we have rabbanim and therapists. Sometimes we have everything. Tonight we have everything. So we're, we're all ready to go. And um, thanks for coming. Next Sunday, and the flyer was wrong, but let me just tell you what next Sunday is. Next Sunday, July 31st, we have a very, very special shir. Rav Agoyen HaTzadik, Rabbi Breidowitz from Arsameh, which will be joining here next week with uh, understanding the story of Eev. Tzadik Veraloi, why do bad things happen with good people? Why do the righteous suffer? Much sure, we'll, we'll touch on it some, a little bit tonight also as well, as we're getting into the three weeks. So uh, let's get into it. Um, tonight we have this chus in honor of having two. I'm, I'm going to say the way it is. Guys, if you don't like it, you can leave. But uh, I would say two of the most special people probably in Kalei that deal with things that uh, pretty much nobody wants to deal with. And the real difficult things and um, the real, the real, real, how do you say it? Admiral amongst admirals, right? The best of the best. So thanks for coming tonight. Machem will get into Rabbi Scala, Rabbi Freed. Um, Machem will be Machazik, everybody here tonight, and uh, should be a tremendous chizik. Tonight's share is 110, and our chaver, our Noah Freed came out with the Gematria. 110 is the Gematria. Shame, Toyva Meitiv. Hashem is the ultimate good, and the Toyva Meitiv. So that's the share 110. Rabbi Freed, I was going to bring you on a long time ago, but I had to wait till the Gematria. I'm sorry. So please uh, be Michael. So thank you again for coming tonight. Um, and, and that's it. Okay, Menachem. Let's start with you. Give a little opening. Tell us what we're here tonight. What are we doing? Good job. Good. I want to welcome everyone. Welcome back. And yes, tonight is a big night. And the truth is, I think tonight we're, we're doing like two shows. One is how to be there for others in time of need. And then how to deal with personal tragedies in life. And I think it's two huge topics. And we're probably not going to have enough time to cover both. But um, I know that the people that we have on tonight don't really have time. So we're going to try our best to get whatever we can. So thank you very much for being with us. Um, there's a saying that when something happens, a trauma, it's not, really, it's not really what happens. It's what you do with it. So many times people go through crisis or whatever challenges and the question is how to deal with it instead of shoving it on the rug is how to talk about it. And at least minimum, you shouldn't say something that makes, makes it worse. Now, by, by now, Baruch Hashem, we're, we're in a matzah that most people understand. Most people are not scared of the word therapy. Most people understand that it has an effect whenever it happens, whether it's childhood, and that has an effect when you grow up. And I, even though there are some people who are still reluctant and don't really understand, I meet many people and there are some out there that still believe that their childhood has no connection with when they grow up, whatever went through it. They can tell me stories that they've experienced and they believe that no, no connection. But I think most people do understand. And when, when crisis does hit, when something does hit, Sometimes it's, it's the, the, the most important time is when, when it happens, whether it's right away, a few days later, weeks later, but 
to know what to do with it, what to say, what not to say. And that's why we have with us tonight the biggest who deal with this day in and day out. And the truth is, you know, we hope that they should go out of business, but I mean, I'll call it Suda Shaloitovoy. Things shouldn't happen, but when, when it does happen and when they're needed, it doesn't make a difference the time and day. It doesn't make a difference in the, in the hour or the weather or anything. When they're needed, they're there for Klal Yisrael. And maybe tonight we'll be able to hear a little bit, some ideas of what every one of us can do or say to be there for those who go through, whether it's neighbors, a family member, friends, so that we can help and be there, not at least not to make it worse. So my tefillah is, Hashem should help. We should have a lot of siyat and deshmaya, and we should be able to take what works, the physic, and we should be able to be there for others when needed. Shkoyach. Shkoyach, beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay, so tonight, show, let's get into it. There's a lot to cover tonight, and let's hop around. So tonight we'll be discussing how to be there for others in the time of need, and how to deal with personal tragedies in life, and there's a lot to talk about. And um, let's get into it. I'm going to read your bio, and then the floor is yours. Here we go. Rabbi Simcha Scholar, MBA, is MA in Chief Executive... Was it is the chief executive of High Life, an international non-for-profit organization that provides critical health services, support services to ser- seriously ill children, their families and communities. Under his direction and guidance, High Life has grown from a single program to a year-round organization with offices throughout the United States and Israel and well, as well as affiliates in Europe and Canada. Today, High Life can touch the lives of more than 5,500 children with life-threatening or long-life illnesses and their families. The organization has two dozen emotional, social, and psychological support Services restore a sense of normalcy and well-being to the families whose lives have been disrupted by serious pediatric illness or the illness of death of a parent whose children are still minors. Our scholar is a musmach of the Mir Yeshiva. He was a rov of for 15 years. He received a master's in business administration and a master's in arts and education from Long Island University. He's a dynamic, frequently requested speaker who has been lectured widely throughout the United States and the author of many time, timely articles of easing the lives of children and families in pain. Our simple scholar, it's to have you here. Floor is yours. It's a privilege to be here, and um, it's a privilege to talk to your overwhelming audience because my uh, screen keeps on popping. So obviously, there's an awful lot of people here. Um, the truth of the matter is, I think um, Rabbi Nachum summed it up well. But the the reality is that in today's generation, we understand that emotional health, mental health, um, is something that is very, very critical. We say it in davening every day. We say it, In the Halukas, we quote David HaMelech. The Haroi Fei L'Shvuei Leiv, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is the one that, that, is, that fixes a broken heart. A broken heart is someone that is emotionally broken. There's Reifei Choylim and Reifei Lishvoi Leif. Choylei HaNefesh carries an equal importance in Halacha as Choylei HaGuf. One can be Mechal Shabbos for Choylei Nefesh. So the Gmar in Shabbos talks about the blind pregnant woman who uh, wanted to uh, ask that a, that, a, that a light be lit in her room. And uh, Chazal say, why would she need a light in her room? She can't see anyway, but she felt like she needed it. And the Chabah brings this down in Shulchan Aruch. So you see the importance of, of, of emotional and mental health. And that's critical. It's, it's critical for us to understand that in order for a family or an individual to make it through a difficult, critical, traumatic situation, they need to be, they, all different parts of that family need to be addressed. The, if it's a physical situation, the medical elements need to be addressed and the emotional things to be addressed. It's important for families to stay together because the family that stays together after the child or individual gets well in Mitzvah Hashem, they'll have a family. And if the family doesn't stay together, meaning that if we don't address the emotional and mental health and psychological needs, like we address the medical needs, then what could happen is the patient will survive and the family won't. So it's imperative that when we deal with 
trauma and when we deal with emotional situations, we, we get the direction that we need from mental health professionals, people with experience, people that understand the consequences of such situations and to be able to deal with it in a very professional manner. Today, and we'll hear soon from Rabbi Fried, but you know, today we are blessed, Baruch Hashem, with mental health professionals who are Erlcha Yidin, who are Tamid Chachomim, who are not necessarily labeled as uh, you know secular Freudian students, but rather they've taken all of the disciplines that uh, they're ought to offer, like like medicine, and they're able to integrate it in the appropriate Teridika Hashkofa that makes our life much more uh, much more uh, livable when we're dealing with traumatic experiences. The Mashkiach Sechar Levracha, with Tzvi Hersh Feldman, the Mashkiach Emir Yeshiva in New York, Mashkiach actually that predated Rav Don Segel. Mashkiach was there when I was, when I was a Bach in Yeshiva, in a different, uh, different century. Uh, he would tell us some, that in every town in Europe, he was a Kelm Talmud. He lived in Kelm. But in every town in Europe, there was an individual who, when there were mental health issues, this individual would would be the one that people would go to. In other words, they also had mental health professionals. Not every Rav is a mental health professional, and not every mental health professional is a Rav. You know, there are there are Rabbanim that Baruch Hashem can pass in Shilas, and I'm sure they can become mental health professionals if that's what they would study. And vice versa, you have mental health professionals that, you know, are excellent in what they do, but there are certain times very critical halachic situations that need, uh, you know, that you know that need to be addressed, and are, and a rub has to be consulted. But when they work together in tandem, then you have the best type of shutvis that you have. Uh, we've found in our work at High Lifeline over the past 35 years dealing with at least uh, you know, 60, 75,000 families and hundreds of thousands of clients, we have found that when you realize that there is a physical illness at times and there is a mental consequence to this, when you realize that trauma is something that needs to be addressed because it's not just something that you can just shake off. It's not necessarily every time someone goes through a traumatic experience, do you need the long-term therapy, but it's something that has to be addressed. When you, re- when you realize this, as I said before, the, co- the, the result of that is an intact family. The result of that is a healthy family. The result of that is a functional family. Studies have shown that the divorce rate doubles when a young child is ill. The divorce rates double because of the trauma that's in a family. And if it's not dealt with properly, sometimes a weak marriage just falls apart. So it's something that we need to acknowledge it's something that we need to get professional help with. It's something that we need to access organizations like High Lifeline and others to be able to deal with life's consequences. Now, that it wasn't needed, or perhaps it was needed 50, 60 years ago, I don't know, or 70 years ago. The reality is that we are living in a different era. We're, li- we're, li- we're living in 2022. We're not as resilient and as strong as our grandparents were in Europe uh, going through pogroms or the Holocaust or other situations like that. We're Americans and, um, you know, we get affected by things that they were, they, you know, they weren't affected by at least outwardly years ago. Today is a different world. It's 2022. And we have to uh, 
um, we have to address it as such. So I, 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 I think I welcome this forum greatly. I welcome the forum that people are going to acknowledge that these type of things need to be addressed. I also welcome the idea that we all can become partners in helping people. And that is something very, very important to understand the achrayas that we all have to be able to help people. And hopefully throughout the conversation, we'll be able to talk more about that. Beautiful. Now I see why it's called the share. You just answered it. Okay, Rabbi Fried. Rabbi Sir Fried, MSW is the regional director of High Life in New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Rabbi Fried has played an instrumental role in the regional in region's growth, extending High Life landscape to families in need, refining the programs and services offered. He's an acknowledged specialist in providing culture, culturally relevant services to hospitalized patients. His presentations to the staff of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia CHOP and other medical centers have enabled large institutions to remain responsive to the needs of their clients. Rabbi Fried heads one of High Lifeline's crisis interventions teams. In addition to caring for families in the midst of emergencies, he's spoken widely on issues relating to crisis intervention, trauma, and how tragedy affects children and family life. While in graduate school, he's co-authored an article of Jewish Communal Service, a professional publication has been written widely for consumer media as well. Under his leadership, Bike for Chai, a two-day 180-mile two bicycle rally to Camp Simcha has grown, become Chai Lifeline's largest single fundraising event. Rabbi Fried is a graduate of the Westbrook School of Social Work, Shiv University, he's earned his BA in Talmudic Studies for Base Manager Kaboa in Lakewood, New Jersey. Rabbi Fried, it's an honor to have you here tonight. Rabbi Fried, the floor is yours. Yeshakayach Oshi, Yeshakayach Menachem, truly, truly an honor to be here tonight. Um, you know, you have a for forum like this, and it's Paischem Echvayd Achsanya, so obviously I'm Pisech with you, Ashi, and with you, Menachem. But whenever we speak about Chesed, and whenever we speak about Klal Yisrael, and, and Chesed and Klal Yisrael, and reaching out to, to people in need, I feel like that Rabbi Scholar is like the Achsanya of that, was a revolutionary 35 years ago, what he created and what he built in the world of Chesed. And it's exactly, I think, 21 years ago, Rabbi Scholar, um, in August, 21 years ago, when I walked into your office, when my wife, Cece, encouraged me to go to social work school and helped me throughout my schooling and throughout my career. So she's an Achsanya as well. Um, but when I walked into your office 21 years ago, um, and I was going to social, I was, I was going to start that September um, social work school, you offered me a case management position in the organization to be a case manager in um, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And you told me then, young man, Merit Hashem, you're gonna be here a lot, a lot of years and you'll have a tremendous atzlach and an impact on Kali Yisrael. So yeah, for that opportunity and for being the achsanya of chesed and Kali Yisrael. You know, I get asked, and I'll, I know Rabbi Scala was talking more in the big picture um, as a social worker and as a caseworker in the younger years as a play therapist, but, you know, I get always asked, I always get asked the question, you know, what's the, what's the most overwhelming feeling when someone is dealing with illness, when someone is dealing with tragedy? What are the right words to say, Srili, when you walk into a hospital room for a parent who has a child that was just diagnosed with cancer? These are questions that I get asked all the time. And the title of the talk today is how to be, how to be there for others in time of need. And I think that Ultimately, the most important thing that after doing this for 21 years as a caseworker, social worker, play therapist, crisis interventionist, is the understanding, the tachlis ayudia is shaloi neida, the understanding that we could never imagine what it must be like for people dealing with challenges. The most overwhelming feeling is that of isolation and loneliness that they are literally the only person in the world dealing with this, cut off physically, emotionally from everybody else in the world. Or Soloveitchik, if you read his book, and Out of the Whirlwind, when he describes his own bout with illness, speaks about that when he was wheeled into surgery and his family said goodbye to him, he said he never understood what David HaMelech says in Tehillim, where we say it, Elul is coming up soon, so we're going to say it every day. We say, he's, David Amel says, Ke'avi ve'imi azavuni va'ashem ya'asfeini. 
And he says he always wondered, has a father or mother ever forsaken a child? What does it mean? He said, but at that moment, when I was being wheeled in to surgery, I realized I'm the only person in the world. I'm the loneliest person in the world. Meeting the only other lonely being in the world, and that's a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And that feeling of isolation and loneliness is the most overwhelming feeling um, when people are dealing with illness. And I think that, I think that when you look back at High Lifeline, and High Lifeline started out as Kam Simcha, as the flagship program, as the only kosher medically supervised oncology camp in the world, and thus turned into 21 year round programs and offices throughout the world. But ultimately, what's the underlying thing, everything that High Lifeline does, is to say that I'm simply there for somebody else in time, in time of tragedy and in time of illness. It's not even the thing that we do. The thing that we do is secondary. The thing that we do is an outcome of just being there. And sometimes we feel that we don't know what to do. We don't know what to say, or we can't imagine what it must be like. So therefore we cross the street and look the other way. But we need to understand to be there for another person doesn't mean to do. It means to be. It means just to be there at moments like that. Um, every service ultimately that High Lifeline provides is simply a means for the relationship to make sure that a case manager, that the organization could be there for people in times of need. We're not there in order to do. We do in order to be there to make sure that we can allevi alleviate some of the loneliness and isolation in, um, in, for people during their times of illness. So if the question is how to be there for others in times of need, it's the understanding that we can never imagine. It's knowing that ultimately it's the isolation and loneliness that's the most overwhelming. It's being there with knowing that I don't have to do. And I know we're gonna discuss it a lot further um, as the program goes along, but I think that that's at the crux of what my passion and the work of High Lifeline is. Oh yeah, beautiful, beautiful opening. Okay, let's take a one minute break. Let's take a poll. I'm gonna take a poll from the Oilam and then we're gonna get into it. Uh, again, we have the discuss of Rabbi Scali here, Rabbi Freed. The Oilam wants it to be interactive. Please text your questions over here. Obviously live questions go first. Text it to Usher Parnas and um, a lot of questions came in. Let's really, there's a lot to cover tonight. Please ask, we wanna all grow together. Okay, let's take this poll. Menachem, can you do the poll? Try it. See if it works. It's not working on my side. Is it on? Do you see it on your screen? Yeah. Okay. Rabbi Scott, do you see the poll? Yes. Okay. Yes, I see it. Kevin Nachum, read it, because I can't see it. Okay. Question number one. As a friend, neighbor, or even family, how do you reach out to someone who is dealing with illness or tragedy? So the first answer is, unfortunately, I don't know how to deal with it. I don't see the whole thing here. The second one is... I'll read it. I got it. I got it. Okay. As a friend, neighbor, or family, how do you reach out to someone who's dealing with illness or tragedy? Three options. Number one, unfortunately, I don't know how to deal with it. I usually end up just staying distant. You just don't know how to deal. You know, you have a friend, a family. You know? Option two, I call them, I go over, and I ask them what I could do to be helpful in any way. Number three, I try to hint or send a message to someone that I'm willing to help. Those are the three choices. Choose one of them. Choose what you do, not, not what you want to do. Everybody wants to do the right thing. The question is, what do you want to do? The second question, the follow-up question, when you personally have, or Hashem, if you would have to deal with a major life challenge, health, death, anything life-changing, what what's your support system? Number one, I turn to family, who's always been there for me, and they're at the core of my support. Option one, option two is I have amazing friends and neighbors who I feel would or have been there for me and my family. Option three, I don't have family and friends. I just, I guess I would have to turn to organizations or, or um, Sadaqas to help me. Answer those two questions. And then you'll share it and read it, okay? Because I don't know if some reason it's not working on myself. No? What's that I'm saying? Good answers. Good answers? Okay. 
I end the poll first. No, no, wait. I'll give it five seconds. Let everybody answer, and then end, and then share. Sure. Oh, it's not ringing. Okay, I'm enough. I'm ending and share. And read it, please. Okay, you see the answers? We have 36% answered. Unfortunately, I don't know how to deal with it. I usually end up staying, um, staying distance. That's 21%, sorry. 56%, I call them, go over and ask them, what can I do to be helpful in any way? And 23% answered, I try to bring, try to hint to them or send a message to someone that I'm willing to help. So that was the first question. Second question is, what's your support system? So we have 51%, I turn to my family who's always been there and they are my supports, my core supports. 34% answered, I have amazing friends and neighbors who I feel I would have that they've been there for me and my family. And 50%, I honestly don't have family friends. 50? 50, 15. Honestly, don't have family friends who can support us. I would reach out to organizations or to Tzedakas. Okay, Moedek, Rabbi Fried, do you have anything to say on the polls? Um, it says 50% of the people are ready to do NASA and Nishma. They're ready to, that's what they say they do? So, so, so I see 56% um, wrote, I call them and go over and ask them what I can do to help. Um, my response to that would be, it, you know, the two key operative words in therapy I heard from Dr. Pelkowitz years ago is it depends, right? So, so the, 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 the key thing here is, um, let's see, is two things. A, is it a public event? B, how close are you with the person? Okay. When I say, is it a public event? Is someone in the hospital? that God forbid someone pass away, right? Is someone clearly losing their hair and therefore everybody knows they're in treatment, right? But if someone is diagnosed with, I don't know, stage four, stage four breast cancer, and they're going, they're still in the process of going to doctors, don't have a treatment protocol, and you heard about it from a next door neighbor that happened to have seen them by the doctor, it could be as close as you are, it's still not the place for you to go. If there is a public event and someone is with a child in a hospital, that means people know. And you're at a level where you are close to them that you wash by their simcha. You don't come to the simcha just, I'm coming to the chuppah, say mazel tov and leave, but you sit down and you wash. That means this is a, this is a simcha that's personal to me then of course you reach out. And reaching out doesn't mean I'm gonna take your kids and I'm gonna send you supper for the next three years. They're not holding at that level yet. Reaching out means I heard you have a child in the hospital. I can't imagine what it must be like for you. I'm here thinking of you. So those are the two key things um, that, I, that, that, that I think is critical is how public it is and how close you are. I think in the second question, second poll, I think Rabbi Scala would probably be more qualified to answer than myself. That's a, that's a big picture question there, how people look. You have to realize most people that responded to the second question, Ushi, right? Um, thankfully, I'm not dealing, hopefully, with illness and tragedy right now, right? So it's a hypothetical question. And the hypothetical question, they gave that answer. Look, I believe that there's no one answer here. Um, it's not things are not mutually ex exclusive of, of of the others. If one has a support system, family, friends, which is a great thing, it, it's not exclusive to be able to to not reach out to an organization. One of the most one of the greatest things we can do is help. And sometimes one of the most dangerous things we can do is help. 
Helping does not mean that they want my opinion. <laughs> they don't want my opinion. Well, I think you should go to this doctor. And my grandmother what was once sick with cancer or once sick with, this, with a kidney disease, and she went to the other doctor. What does that have to do with my diagnosis and our diagnosis? You know, one of the one of the most interesting things, and I'm, I'm Rabbi Fried will, will I'm sure concur in this. One of the most interesting things that we observe is, is when someone goes to me Menachem Oval. They go to me Menachem Oval. Usually the halacha, not usually that you know the halacha is the 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 Oval, you know, is supposed to start the conversation. Uh, we always have this need of starting the conversation, whether it's halakhically correct or incorrect, it's not, not important. And for some reason, you want to know the story. Like maybe I don't want to share the story, but you want to know the story. So I was sitting um, by Anichem Avelim, and um, this person was sitting next to me. Uh, he wasn't, um, he wouldn't wash at the wedding, is what my feet said, so aptly said it. <laughs> he would go to the wedding, maybe because he likes uh, the Vini's table here that was at the back of the, uh, at the end of the wedding. But, but and he started to speak to the person about um, you know uh, you know about the hospital that that um, you know this the this person's father was in, and he was um, uh, you know, he was he was kind of like feeling guilty that maybe I went to the wrong hospital, maybe I should have went to a different hospital, maybe my child would have lived then. And he was talking about his father. No, my father went to the hospital to that hospital. It was a great hospital. So the guy felt very good. He said, how's your father now? Well, he died a little while ago. <laughs> Didn't realize what, what, what they were actually doing. What they, they wanted to do something good, but what they actually did was something catastrophic. Helping, you need to know how to help sometimes. You need to know how to help. You need to know what to say. You need to know your limitations. So... When a, when a family and friends that want to help, that's that's great. But sometimes you have to, you know, understand the parameters. So working sometimes hand in hand with an organization, with people that really have experience about this type of stuff, that really understand the the implications of everything, could actually be very very helpful. Um, and there's no one solution, but I think there's a lot of resources out there that if people will work together with the organization, then I think the family will, will be able to gain that much more. Just to, no Ushi, just to, just to echo, you know, what Rabbi Scholar is saying, I, I always tell families when I, when I meet them um, initially in times of need, um, you know, there are so many there are so many well-meaning neighbors, family members, sister-in-laws, brother-in-laws, parents, in-laws, organizations, etc. You, 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 you have no idea right now ultimately what's going to work for you. Ultimately, none of us choose to go down the path of illness, chas v'shalom, or tragedy. It's not the way life is supposed to be. There is no roadmap for it, and. Ultimately, you're going to decide what works for you. And if it works for you to take from family, then you'll take from family. But there will, there will be that Tuesday after you took from family for two months that you just simply feel you can't now. There's too many strings attached. And that's when an organization needs to be ready to step up. It's never about those that help you. It's not about the organization. It's not about the mother-in-law. Or the, or the father-in-law or your parents or your sister-in-law. Ultimately, it's about you, that family going through that. And they're entitled to make decisions on the fly. And just because, like the classic example I'll give, uh, to bring out Rabbi Scala's point, the classic example I'll give is someone going through a difficult time, wasn't going to open up to a friend, and finally pours her heart out to a friend one Sunday night after the show, before the show, she, she, of course, they're on the show. Um, friend calls the next day or the next week and like con ready to continue the conversation. Like we had a real DMC the other night. We're going to continue. That person going through it doesn't want to discuss it anymore. 
not because he did anything wrong, because that was them at that moment, is the cycle of illness, the ups and the downs we take from organizations, then we don't want, then we want from a sister-in-law, then we don't want. It's up, the Otis is on us as an organization, as helpers to adapt to the family. The family is entitled to make the decisions. They don't need to be consistent. A very, very important point, you know, you know the, 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 the Rabbi Fried is bringing up. I heard numerous times from Rashid Zafarim and Rabbi Dabba Feinstein, who was the um, seer and mentor and leader of High Life for many, many years, who told us that ultimately he was, at, he, he, he was talking about an individual's decision in a medical decision, uh, decision about a child, decision about themselves. He said, it's their decision. The most you can do is present the information. Now, and if they're in, you know, a sane mental state, then they make their own decision because it's, it's, it's their life. It's their child's life. Even to the point where I know they're making the wrong decision. But the most we can do is present to them the information. The, great, the greatest error that we can make by trying to help people is by offering our opinion when it's not asked. It's by telling them what to do when they don't want to hear what I want them to do. If they're, if they're intelligent people, and most people are intelligent people, and you explain to them what the situation you know, is, and the benefit, perhaps, of taking supper tonight from the, you know, you know, from the neighbors, the benefit of perhaps going for a second opinion, even though these are two extremes, but it's really the same thing. The benefit of maybe, you know, let's talk to the school and maybe the kids, uh, you know, your, the children or the siblings are, are having a hard time. The benefit of all these things. And if it's done in a loving, caring way, respectful, then chant the overwhelming the overwhelming majority of times they will accept it and take it. But ultimately it's their decision. That's a very, very important point. I'll be a shkofa and I'll be a I, I, can I add to this? Sure, sure. No, 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 the, the, the questions are coming in as you guys are talking. Don't worry, I'm preparing the bomb. Continue, don't worry. <laughs> um, so, so Rabbi Skal gave the hashkafic um, and halachic perspective of decision, of allowing them to make their own decision. Um, you know, but I'm gonna give I'm gonna give a little bit from as a social worker. I'll give my perspective on it as well. I, I think that whenever you're dealing, um, whenever you're dealing with illness um, or God forbid tragedy. Whenever a person's dealing with a challenge, there's that feeling of helplessness, that feeling that I'm not in control over my destiny. In a moment's notice, in a moment's notice, my child was diagnosed with cancer. I may have a degenerative disease. God forbid this tragedy in the family. You know, we all live our lives that we want to be in control of our lives. And then in a moment's notice, all that is taken away and there's an overwhelming feeling of helplessness. There is at times a need by others to help, to take control and help you out. Like I'll not only send you supper, I'll take your kids, I'll send you supper, I'll pick up the cleaners, I'll take care of everything. And you're not allowing our family during their most helpless moments to have an area that they feel a sense of control over their environment. Rabbi Scala presented it from a halach perspective, what Rabbi David Zatzal said, allowing them to make decisions. Um, you know, I, I'm saying it from a perspective that it's helpful for them to cope. Rabbi Chaim Shmulevit says that Shleim HaMelech in the most challenging of times, he had nothing said, he was a king on his stick. You need to be in control over something. And that gives you the ability to cope. If I may share a story Ariskala knows the story because I called him right after it happened, and it happened 20 years ago, a year into my work in High Lifeline. It was a mother in Lakewood who had a, a daughter 
um, that had, um, at the time, sadly, she was nephteris and neuroblastoma stage four. She was going to CHOP every single day, waking up, taking her kid to the hospital, um, and then coming back at five o'clock in the evening. And she had a large family and I kept offering supper, you know, as a young case manager, I felt like, oh, she like a, like a mortgage broker, the more services I offered and got a family to accept, I thought the more, I thought that was my chance for a raise from Rabbi Scholar. That's how I looked at it. Literally the more push, push, sir, I offered food, food. She always respectfully declined. Then the neighbors called me and said, Rabbi Fried, this is not normal. She's going to the hospital five days a week and she has a large family at home and she's declining food. So I said, I can't send, she said, no. But as neighbors, of course, go ahead and send. And that night when she came home was this magnificent dinner waiting for her, for her and her children. I got a call from her that night and said, and she says as follows, she said, Rabbi Fried, next time when my neighbors call, please respectfully decline. Please understand from the moment my daughter was diagnosed, my entire life has been turned upside down. There's one thing, one thing I have. I wake up every morning at 5 a.m., I say my Tehillim, I cook dinner for my children and I take it out from that for them when I come back from the hospital at five o'clock. Please don't take that away from me. Don't take it away from me. We tend to not allow people in time of need to have that makal, to make that decision, to be in control. As Rabbi Scala said, to allow them to make medical decisions. We have to offer, we have to be there, but at the same time, we have to allow families to make decisions. Okay, I'm afraid let's jump into the questions here. Okay, first question live, let's go, you're on. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is generally, you know, as a person myself who has gone through challenges, you know, maybe more or less, um, you know, I wanna know, sometimes, you know, some of us are so emotionally disturbed with our own challenges when we hear someone else is going through something. I could say at least with myself, it happened once at least. You know, I just, I'm so numbed of feeling emotions. I don't, I don't feel that I could feel for the other person, but it bothers me that I can't feel for them. So in such situations, how are we supposed to like balance properly? Should we first focus on ourselves or should we at least try for others? You know, is the fact that at least it bothers us that we can't feel for others, is that enough? Like, how do we focus? You know, I know sometimes we hear there are certain people, there are such sadikim, they, they put other, their challenges, their, their things away, and they, they gave it up and they felt for others, even though they had their own thing. So, like, what is the proper balance in a regular average person to, you know, navigate their challenges with other people's challenges? I speak to, there, are, there, are, there are many different levels of feeling, you know, uh, you, know you, you can feel for someone that uh, you would uh, actually cry with somebody, you can feel for someone that you'll totally give up your, 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 yourself for, for somebody else. That's an, that's an extreme level of, uh, of, of hargasha, of feeling that, uh, you know, only very unique people can actually do that, you know. You, you heard it terrible story and you just couldn't sleep that night uh you know but there are different levels you know there there's the level that that's a call to action and then there's a level of of just of recognizing that there's someone else in need when we dive in three times a day we don't necessarily dive, we don't dive for ourselves we say we for a new we speak you know we 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 talk about the chayla yisrael we talk about the people in general who need Parnasa, the people of, of the world who need uh, Mashiach. So there, there are different levels. I, I don't think you should feel uh, any guilt about uh, not feeling to what you perceive to be the, 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 the optimum level of feeling. I think the mere fact, if you, if you, if you're, if you even have the basic level of, of, of davening, the basic level of, of uh, of recognizing that there are people out there that need a refuah shalema, there are people that need help. Perhaps I can't 
help them now because I'm not up to that point in my life because of different things that happen. Oh, that's okay. And eventually I'll get there, but don't ever feel um, guilty because you didn't do a positive, you know, enough positive action. That that I, that I think you're being unfair to yourself. I think that if you if you if you just open up your sitter three times a day, you've you, you've done an awful lot. Okay, let's jump on to the next live question. You're on. Okay. Um. Hi. I I work as a physician assistant in a local children's hospital in the oncology ward. And where? And where? And where? Um in Cohen Children's Medical Center oh. in New York. Um, and I guess I was just wondering kind of what my role would be. You know, we have from families occasionally. Um, they're not necessarily my direct patients, but, you know, I see them on the floor and I always wonder like if it's my place to go over and introduce myself and ask if there's anything I could help them with or would they prefer their privacy? I just always kind of never really sure what to do with myself. And if there's any guidance, I feel like that would be really helpful for me. I can address that every scholar. Um, first of all, thanks for your work. Um, Ashracha, thank you. I, I think that it is a, it, at times it's a very tricky balance. Um, I can tell you there are times that, that there are families in the hospital that, you know, for example, myself and the work that I do in CHOP and we get volunteers, um, again, pre-COVID days that we got volunteers from Penn, University of Pennsylvania, so sometimes there were, there were families that appreciated more um, volunteers from Penn than volunteers from Lakewood, even though that maybe culturally they weren't so aligned with them because there was that anonymity and that feeling of um, guarantee that they'll be, you know, that they'll be a confidential. So there are definitely families that may not want to see someone from within the community. But I think there is there is always, you know, what's called nera ve'ena nera, right? To make sure to be around, to bump into them, but not in an intrusive way. It's, a, it's an art, um, walking down the hallway and knowing when a family is gonna leave. But once you meet them in a public setting, I think there could be a sense of um, a very reassuring feeling to somebody saying that there is someone from and that can look out for me, that can understand what it means, how challenging Shabbos is gonna be, or can understand my needs, someone that gets it. So there's value to that, there's no question, and that can be very helpful to a family. At the same time, you never know who knows who's which machutin. So to be, you know, to be intrusive, you have to be aware of that as well. So it's a balance, but try to make sure that you bump into that. It's always, it's always an art, walking the hospitals, I, we ha I have it every day as a case management. I don't go as often. I only go once a week now to the hospitals. But back in the day, there were always families in the hospital that didn't reach out to High Lifeline, right? But ultimately, you wanted to make sure that they know that you're there and that we allow them to make the decision if they want the help or not. So you want to make sure that you get yourself in front of them at the right time, but not to be intrusive. Beautiful. Okay. You're on. Hello. Yeah, hi, do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So my question is about the art that you just described being more specific. Um, I find that I'm able to give off, convey both messages to people that I'm close with. Empathy and acknowledging what they're going through. And at the same time, giving them the message that we're equals, you're normal. But when it comes to acquaintances, people who are not necessarily bringing it up, but we both know that we both know, how do I convey the empathy? Because I'm so sensitive to their possible potential feelings of discomfort. I think we got the question, Robert Fried, you got the question? I think I think what she's asking or she is the difference between like you both know something, but it's like not comfortable and she's sensitive to their feelings as well. But but then again, going back to the question, she said 
I'm not sure if she said acquaintances versus friends, right? Acquaintances versus friends. There is a big difference. There's a big difference there. So again, if something is public, right? Even if it's an acquaintance, right? Even if it's a even if it's a colleague, if someone, God forbid, loses a child and you're working with a workmate and you have to acknowledge it, you have to go to Shiva, right? Um, if someone has a child in the hospital and everyone's aware of it, right? Is It's a public event, so to speak. Then there is a difference between just saying, acknowledging it versus um, being intrusive and asking questions, right? Um, but... If it's not a public event, even if you're both aware of it, if it's an acquaintance, um, I don't think that you have to take the cue from them. I don't think that you should be saying anything. Again, she used the word acquaintance as opposed to a friend, colleague, right? So I was going to ask her that question, what exactly she was referring to. I'm going to put it back. She came back. Let's unmute. Um, yeah. Star six. Yeah. You're on. Okay. So yes, you you basically addressed the question, even though I got disconnected. Um, just to clarify, it's sometimes I find that I'm erring on the side of caution of trying to. Uh, I'm not avoiding it because of my own discomfort. I'm avoiding the topic because I'm scared they might think I'm never hurting them. And that's the last thing I want to do. I, I so don't, sometimes I, I don't. I don't think acknowledging and saying I'm thinking of you and I can't imagine what it must be like is ever never. It's, a, it's not a question of mm -hmm. never. It's a question is how close are you and how public an event it is. If you just heard from others that she was recently diagnosed um, with a certain type of cancer and she's not in a hospital and she looks normal and just, just she knows that you know a neighbor that happens to have a loud mouth that for sure told you and you're not a close friend, oh, no, you shouldn't acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. What's this but Nebuchadnezzar is not part of the equation. It's not about, I'm afraid what I'm going to say, I'm going to be never, it's about your, your, we, how public it is and how, and your level of relationship. There's no nebuching and saying when reaching, when saying to a person um, that's even an acquaintance, right? That's in, that's in the office, right? Um, that had a kid in the hospital and therefore hasn't been at work for a month. And she comes back, doesn't mean everybody in the office goes over at the same time, but it's to go over and say, you know, Rachel, um, you know, I heard about, I, I heard about your daughter. I just want to let you know that we're always thinking of you and we're here for you. There's never nebuching to that. I'm not saying you don't have okay, money. I'm not saying you're not coping. I'm not saying that you became a hospital mom because of that. You're a colleague. You have been out for a month. Let me ask you a question. A colleague is out for a month and you don't acknowledge it, and she works at the cubicle over, oh, next cubicle over, can she sit there and say that during my most challenging time of my life, the girl that sat right next to me didn't tell me one word? Right, so tell I think word. that's already, you know, that, that way I would really, I would be a little bit more clear that, you know, it's required to acknowledge it. I'm talking about cases where the person brings up a little you know, says, throws out a line or like, oh, I'm so tired or like kind of like hints to the topic and you're not sure if you're supposed to acknowledge it and start talking about it or, you know. I mean, Scott, you want to take it a little further? I think that there's a, that there's a big difference between acknowledging and being empathetic and, you know, making the person feel like, you know, you really care without probing and without asking the details and without getting into anything personal. I think most people want to know that they're not alone. I think, I, I think as Rabbi Fried described that one of the most critical consequences of any type of trauma, illness, 
difficult situation is absolute isolation. That you're, you're all alone in this. And when someone comes and, and just expresses their, their, uh, their, their friendship and just, their, you know, their concern without saying, you know, what happened and maybe I can help you or maybe there's just, you, you know, your, your own warm self, you know, it means a lot to people. It really means a lot. Yes, there, there could be people who just want to be totally, you know, isolated. But those are usually the, it's a very, very small, small amount. Most people, you know, want to feel that people are, are concerned. They may not want help. They may not, uh, you know, want to ride to the hospital. And they, you know, they, you know, they want to be independent, but, you know, they're, they're, they kind of feel good that there are, you know, that they have friends out there and there are people, you know, concerned. There's a big difference between showing friendship, showing empathy, and showing, you know, and, and, and making them into needy people. <laughs> big difference between the two. Not everyone needs to be needy. Not everyone needs to be thrown gifts at. But most people don't want to be alone. Most people don't want to go through a tunnel all alone. The best we can do, we don't have to show people the end of the tunnel. That's how Akadosh Baruch Hu does that. What we need to do is give people candles within the tunnel. Yep, there's a famous... The th tunnel, yeah, the end of the tunnel, that's Akadosh Baruch Hu. In the yeah. tunnel... Rabbi Scala has a famous story from Shlomo Kavach. He says one of his songs... That there was a guy who traveled to the Rebbe. Rebbe Fried, you know this one? He traveled to the Rebbe for days and days. They came to the Rebbe and said, the Rebbe, my kid's very sick. Da, da, da. And the Rebbe was like very cold. He's like, I see the Shemaim is closed. There's nothing I could do. The guy was Mamash Shabrachan and he like left. And then he, you know, he left. And then if, like a few hours later, the Rebbe realized he was cold to him. So he chased after him and he finally met him, you know, down the Rito. Half a day later, he said, even though there's nothing I could do for you, I could sit and cry with you. And they sat together and they cried for an hour. and said, ah, oh, now the Shemaim is open. You know what I mean? That's the words. I'm sitting with somebody in their matzav. Yeah, just just be with somebody. That's just be with somebody. Don't even say anything. You know, most people, you know, a lot of times when people are in a very difficult situation, whether it's medical, whether it's trauma, whether it's bereavement or death, if you if you don't know what to say, most people say the wrong thing, <laughs> and you kind of make the situation worse. But if you don't say anything, you're just with the person. Yeah, that's sometimes very meaningful. 100% correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, to bring oh, sorry. yeah, to bring out Rabbi Scala's point of, you know, just being there, right? Sometimes people feel uncomfortable with another person's sorrow and pain. So they feel that they need to come up with words and they need to come up with things to do because they just can't be there with another person's sorrow. So our, what we're saying and what we're doing is about us. It's not about the person. Like Rabbi Scal says, just be there. My wife, um, my wife, Cece, who's a therapist, once told me uh, when I was discussing this concept of empathy and just being there. She so says, when you sit with a, he's sitting with a client and they start crying and there's a box of tissues on the desk and you pass the tissues to them, what you're doing is, it's about yourself, not it's, it's not about them. You felt uncomfortable just to be there with their pain. They knew they could take the tissue. It's right there in front of them. It's bringing out Rabbi Scala's point. We don't need to do anything. Just be there. Just be there. And sometimes our need to do is because we feel so uncomfortable with someone else's pain and we feel we need to do something. So it's about us. It's not about them. It might be getting warmed up. Okay, you're on. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. First of all, thank you so much. This is fantastic. A different question on a different topic. How do I deal? So Rabbi Fried explained so clearly there's a public story and a private story. So I'm talking about a public story. And it's a person on my block. So I don't know if I would wash by their chasna, but it's definitely someone I know and it's public on the block. But the story is that the child died because he overdosed. What's the right way to react to that? 
the referee, this is right. This is um, on a daily basis, you're dealing with this. <laughs> Sadly. Um, when you're asking what's the right way, what, what are you asking? Are you asking, do you bring it up? Do you ask her a question of um, how did your child pass away? What's, what, what are you asking? Did, did that mother tell you something that you're questioning, how do I respond? The mother didn't question, the mother didn't say anything. I am aware that it happened. I am aware they are sitting Shiva. I have to go over to be Menachem Ovel because I live two doors away. And what's the right way for me to react? The right it's way obviously is not to ask any questions, that's obvious. The right way is to react as you do any Nechem Avela. You take the cues from the mother. You take the cues from the mother. So if she's talking about how amazing a child um, her child was, then you listen and hopefully you can share stories. If she's talking about and say his struggles were so great and he tried so hard to overcome them, you say, I can't imagine what that must be like. If she's saying he fought this so heroically, you validate that. You're going to take the cues from that mother. If she sits there and says, you know, drug addiction is an illness like any other illness. People don't grasp it and people don't understand. You know, people only give sympathy to those that have cancer, but not to someone that has an addiction, right? You don't need to be an addiction specialist to listen and empathize. But you're gonna, you don't know what approach the parent is taking to this. There are parents that can be angry at the system. There are parents that can look at this and be very open about it. I've been to houses where a child that, um, I've been to Shiva houses where a child, um, you know, OD'd and they're very open about it. And that then you respond accordingly. You have to take the cue from them and that's how you respond. You also, and I, I think it's very, very important to realize what Rabbi Fried said, that when a, a, if a, a child ODs or commits suicide or some other horrific thing, it's an illness. It's an illness. Mental illness is an illness. Addiction is an illness. It's, a, it's, as, it's, as, it's as dangerous as any physical illness, maybe even more dangerous, because sometimes in a mental illness, there's really no chemotherapy to solve the problem. So if we, if we focus in on that, that it's an illness and see exactly how the parents are dealing with it, then you know, then you know exactly what your reaction should be. Don't be afraid of it. Just be, just be part of their pain. I wanted to mention one thing from the lady who said before about like, you know, embarrassed to ask and what to say and also like this, like the longer you make it uncomfortable, the more of it complicated it is and the harder it is. And it would be very uncomfortable for years down the road, you sit next to somebody and they never mentioned that, 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 that they're dealing with a sick kid, you know what I mean? Like it makes the, the uncomfortability, it's better to take the horses by the reins right away than let it build into something more than what it really is. Just breaking that ice in a, in, a, in a nice way. Again, if the person shuts you down and you feel a pushback, you know what I mean? Okay, but at least you tried. There are people that do that. Look, the, the greatest, the, the, we all have a need for, for information. We all want to know exactly the details. But Chazal said, Sometimes shtika is the greatest. Sometimes the greatest nechama to somebody is not saying anything. You're just saying I'm walking in after that. They need to talk, they'll talk to you. And if they don't want to talk, then you did your mitzvah. So here's um, here's a question somebody sent in. I know we're talking about this, but it's more specific. My sister lost her husband recently, and I want to I want to reach out and help her. How soon is the is an appropriate time to do so, and how to go about it? 
Um, so, we're dealing, we're dealing with this, this thing the whole time. Just, let's, let's get more into clarity. Like, how do you know when is the right time? When is, you know what I mean? Talking about when a tragedy hits, not, not six months down the road, right? Everybody wants to jump. Everybody wants to help. You know what I mean? So, so, so first of all, the question doesn't identify, the question doesn't identify, you know, if this was a tragedy. I mean, every death is tragic. But if it was a sudden death or after an illness, right? Meaning if it was after an illness, <laughs> and it's a sister, so then there are patterns that were already that were already set up, right? Um, of how much they're willing to accept, not willing to accept. Um, if it's chas v'shalom, um, a sudden death, I think a sister, um, it's incumbent upon reaching out. Again, the first step of empathy and being there, as Rizkal spoke about numerous times already. But then to identify one specific need, never to keep it open-ended. The open-endedness of I'm here for anything um, when a family is overwhelmed and doesn't know what they need is to be able to just to pick up a small achievable thing, right? To identify one thing is to say, can I help with pickups um, for the kids um, on Tuesdays? Don't keep it open-ended. Don't keep saying, I'm going to do all pickups from now on, right? Because what happens is, A, you're not going to be able to do it. B, there may be resentment afterwards, right? C, you're taking over. Rather to identify a need. And if they resist, I wouldn't say if they resist, or if they decline, right? Um, then, you know, to be able to identify a need again, and then you drop it if they don't want to accept anymore. But if it's a sibling, of course you have to reach out. But identify one specific area that you know you can do well, that you're not coming from across 45 minute drive to do it. So it's easy for them to accept it, right? So the concept would be, is to be saying, Rifki, I happen to work right next to where Nechama goes to play group and Tuesdays usually work for me. So can I do Tuesdays? Does that work for you? You created, it was very concrete, very specific, very achievable. Um, you didn't make them feel that you're being a hero. No one, you know, going back to that Neba question, right? Don't be a hero, right? Don't be a hero. Heroes, they're, they're, again, Klal Yisrael is, is at a level of their chesed is just, it's Le'om and Kiyosupra. Look at the amount of organizations and look at the amount that Yechidim do, right? But there are times that we can fall into a trap of being a hero, right? Um, to do a heroic action, which is I'll go at 3 a.m. to help my friend on the parkway um, um, to change his tire. But if, I'm, but if I'm in a dorm room with my friend and the window is open and it's cold at night, and he says, can you please close the window? I say, no, 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 not me. You get ahead and you go ahead and do it, right? Why is that? Because heroic actions, we get the adrenaline, we could go ahead and do it, but the small little details is sometimes the hardest thing to do. Find a small little detail, not something, not something that's heroic, achievable, that's going to be meaningful to them and take it from there. Yeah. So she, concrete be, answer. Beautiful. I, I like it. It's very... Somebody sent in this question. Very you, Elisha, you got to remember the, 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 three, the three strikes and you're out rule, which okay. is you go off it three times and they respectfully decline your out. That, that means you doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Right, right. Doesn't no, mean I, anything I, wrong. Okay, I want to read this question. Please keep me anonymous. Thank you. I've been diagnosed for my third time with cancer. I'm in my 60s, of course, Baruch Hashem, I'm alive, and I'm walking miracle. However, I have no desire to speak to my friends about it. I know I have to tell them. How can I politely tell them that I can't talk about it, but still could use their support? And this, is this even possible? I'm mentally and physically drained. Please, okay. So basically the question is, he's diagnosed for the third time, and he wants to not share, but he wants their support at the same time. Is that something's even possible? He wants their support? Yeah. 
So does he, he have one? He just doesn't want to deal with it. He's like, does he have up. one person we can talk to? Let's say yes. Then let that person be the representative. Okay. Very practical answer of a scholar. It's not a big picture. Let's answer. jump into this. Excellent answer. Okay, interesting question. I'm seeing with my children that they're not so motivated to go and do things and help people. I would even say that they're very entitled. And I'm seeing it more and more in this generation, in my opinion. When I was growing up, it seemed more into doing things and trying to build organizations. How our parents should, how as parents, should I be more globally, like to start a Jewish community, to start working on the next group of us, Skudim, to make more organizations like High Lifeline and all these other organizations. Is, the, is our youth here today, as we were back in the day, how can we inspire kids to, draw, to be driven, to grow, and to be movers and shapers? <laughs> In my opinion, that's the number one problem in Klai Yisrael today. Number one problem in Klai Yisrael today, and there, there are many issues that, that people are addressing, but the number one problem is the lack of young people going into Jewish communal service, leadership, chinuch, and those type of uh, important things to keep the, to keep the Klai Yisrael running. Now there are many, you know, you know, there are many reasons, there are economic reasons, there are valid reasons. We're not, we're not gonna get this is not the forum, you know, to talk about that. Maybe you'll have another forum. But but this this idea to dedicate one's life to the Claudius role, to start a Hatsala, to start a high lifeline, to start the other things that the all the important organizations of the Claudius role, it's something that we have to keep on. Uh, inspiring our children by telling them that that's a that's an incredible goal. Well, you know these are the heroes of 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 our community. This is an important thing to do. This is something to be proud of. And think about that for a second. I mean, the the the, the amount of learning today in various different communities is is loyumaki is super. You walk into a you know to a shul Shabbos afternoon. You see, you know. Tens of young alike sitting and learning. The amount of chesed and stalker that comes out of different communities is just unbelievable. So it's just unbelievable. The numbers are just unbelievable. Yet this particular thing of people coming in and and uh, dedicating their lives to working for the Klal Yisrael, no matter what they're doing, is is a, is a real issue. Uh, you know, I've had numerous meetings with people with with colleagues that are heads of organizations and everyone has the same problem. Who's going to take over? It's a real issue. It's a real issue. Now, the organizational life has come a long way. You know, we understand now that we have to get people to make a living, you know, but um, so that's, that's a, you know, that's, that's a major achievement, but on the, but, but we need people. We need people. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not here to, to comment on the the chinuch system of the of, of the yeshivas, but just from a from a from a family perspective, it's it's an ideal. It's something to be proud of. It's something that we can infuse our you know we, we have to infuse our children to do, and they want to do, and even if they only give up meister of their of their life, a couple of years. The difference that will make in the over all the overwhelming majority of institutions and and uh, community organizations and clients will be enormous, enormous. Give up myself, a couple of years. Give up a couple of years, and then then you know become a become a rebbe and become a teacher. Give up a couple of years. Every scholar, at the same time, what would you say? How many, how many girls and boys are on a waiting list to come into Camp Simcha? That's true. There are hundreds of boys and girls on a waiting list to go to Camp Simcha. I'm sure many, many people here on this, uh, on this call probably called somebody to get a friend of theirs as a counselor in Camp Simcha. If you haven't, you're probably not part of the Jewish community. But... <laughs> But, and and it, and it, and it, and, it, and, it, and it just tells you that these people, you know, these people, these young men and women, you know, they're at the prime of their life. They want to do. 
They want to do. They want to do. The yeshivas are doing a good job. You know, they're teaching people. There are issues. There are problems in the community. Uh, plenty of problems. But overall, they're doing a good job. The product that's, that's coming out of the yeshiva system today is a superior product. Boys, you know, girls, you know, it's a superior product in terms of their learning, in terms of their, uh, you know, their midas, you know, in terms of their awareness to, to, to different things. So it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous product. It's a much better product than came out when I was uh, in, in high school. When I was in high school, nobody was making Simon Mesechus, let alone Sima Shas. When I, when, I, when I was in high school, you, you know, how many girls, uh, you know, that went out of high schools, uh, you know, wanted to support a, a young man in it was, it was It was, you know, few and far between. And look at the dramatic change in the, in, the, in the Jewish community in the past 45 years. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Welcome to any Jewish community in the world. I travel the world. Any Jewish community in the world, look at the from Yidin in the world, the B'nai Tyre in the world. It's incredible. At night, in the Beis HaMedrish, learning. It's a serious leverage on the woman's part and the men's part. Incredible. Yet, we still have an issue. So we have a prime, we have, we, have, we, have, we have a great product. We have people, as Rabbi Fried said, that want to get involved in these organizations. They're there on the waiting list in Camp Simcha. And I'm sure in other uh, programs, you know, they're also waiting lists, maybe not as large as ours, but they're a waiting list. They want to get involved. They want to do good things. Let's give them the opportunity to do it. That's where the future is going to be. That's where the future is going to be. And if we don't do it, then we're jeopardizing our children and grandchildren's future. And that's our that's our role as individuals. It's not just the, the people that are that are heading the organization. It's our role as parents. It's our it's our role as 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 concerned community members. Okay, beautiful of a scholar. Okay, hi, sorry, you're on. Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, hi, uh, you know, high lifeline, I guess your forte is, you know, people with cancer, but what about um, people with, you know, friends, family, relatives with certain degenerative illnesses, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, I, you know, I, I don't know if, dealing with them, you have to deal with them in a different way. I have a friend um, who I would like to visit. She's she's in a home right now because she has early stage Alzheimer's. And I don't know how to bought, you know, I don't know how to approach her with that. I, it, would it be a different dynamic than say a family with, um, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the trash, you know, with, with, with a specific tragedy like cancer. Well, this is, yeah, obviously, a, a lingering, slow-growing type of, you know, pain. But you know, but I'm sure it's you know, painful as well. But how how do you think I could approach my friend, or you know, offer to help in whatever way? You know, it's it's you know, it's not like she's completely debilitated, or you know, or at least not at that stage. Do you deal at all with that, or would you know how to deal with? Uh, would you, would you know how to deal with that situation? I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, Ashi, first of all, so sorry mm -hmm. about what your friend is going through. And it's as challenging as it is, it's good to see that she has a friend like yourself. Mm -hmm. um, as an organization, we don't only deal with, um, with cancer. Actually, most of the diagnosis that we deal with um, or other illnesses, um, genetic life-threatening illnesses, but really yeah. focused, but really focused on children. We do not yeah. deal with the um, adult and elderly population only in limited cases if there are young children involved. Um, as an organization, you always need to know what you could do and what you don't do. I'm not in any way minimizing or saying that the pain or suffering mm -hmm. of your friend and 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 her family is in any way less um, than when a family deals with cancer. 
Um, God forbid if I, if, I, if I would say that, I can't imagine what it must be like for her. But I think that in a case like that is to be able to identify a family member, a child, a sibling, a spouse um, that is very close um, to the situation and may know exactly clinically with where she's holding and say, listen, I would love to reach out. What's yes. the best way to do it? When, sure. when is yes. a good day? When is a good day? How do you recommend I do it? Um, in these situations, yeah. especially in degenerative diseases, you want to hear from family members. They know they're more intimately involved and know how their family member is doing, and they can guide you in how yeah. to reach out. Thank you very much. Yeah. She has a nephew, so maybe I'll talk to the nephew. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I'm going to read this question. Okay, the person doesn't want to read it, but she, she usually does ask, but she's too emotional for her. When I was told that I have a gene for ALS, I was rather devastated. The generic, the genetic counselor brought up that my children must be, what must be going through. I was so overwhelmed with my own situation. I could not think of anything or anyone else. All I wanted to know is that my siblings and my children wanted to be tested. I didn't cry. I just said to help and ask Hashem to take this gene away and restore my nerves. What should I be telling my children and my siblings? My father died from ALS. My children and siblings do not want to be tested since there's really nothing to be done about it anyway. She has ALS herself. Am I free? Is she saying in the question that she has the gene or is she saying that she has ALS? She has ALS. She has ALS. And the question is again, was she? That I'm her reading sibling, it, paraphrasing it. Her siblings, her children don't want to be tested because they feel. Like what's the difference if I have it on a die anyway? There's no, there's no, you know, there's no point. It's bottom here. And she feels to broken about that, that they're not trying to be tested. It's a very challenging question. And again, I'm sorry what you're going through. I can't imagine. At the same time, I think that we need to know that when we two things. When we deal with certain challenges, we may feel that the way we're going to cope is to do something about it for others, right? So sometimes to give a generic example, a parent that has a child with cancer and feels that the best way that worked for them was to make sure that kids go to therapy. So they'll reach out to another family in a similar situation and say, I'm telling you this absolutely worked for me. You should do that too. It's how we cope. It's how we take our challenge and we say, we're going to do something positive about it. But ultimately we need to understand that everybody is an individual and everybody's entitled to cope how they feel. So you may feel that another needs to know. Another may feel it's going to hurt me to know because my, my quality of life now will be impacted by knowing that I may have ALS. So I would rather not know. And we have to allow everybody to cope as they wish. And although we have that need coming from a very, very good place to take the challenge, and I commend you, you're taking your own challenge. And not only are you thinking about yourself, but you're thinking about others. And that's a very special and noble thing to do. But at the same time, the others have the right to say, we're okay. We don't want to know. Okay. Let's jump into this question. I lost my father two years ago, and I actually moved on. But what bothers me more is I feel like I have forgotten him. How do I hold on to the feelings of him and the loss? The opposite. So, Ariskal, I'll take this. I'll take this one as well. Um, there is that constant. It's a very common thing in grief, and we're so sorry for your loss. And uh, you know, a lot of what I'm going to address is general, as some of these specific questions really are very tailored to each individual that 
if follow-up is needed, you can reach out to me privately or to someone in Chai Lifeline afterwards. Um, but I will I will address it in a, in, in a in a general form, which is to say that it's very, very common when dealing with loss that we want to hold on. We want to hold on to the memories. We want to hold on to the pictures. We want to hold on to the smells. We don't want to wash the linen. And we're constantly feeling that we're losing them again. What we need to know is that as time goes on, we don't move on. We don't move on. We never move on from a loss. But the experience is different. Our president, Joe Biden, once spoke to widows. He speaks a lot about grief. He lost two children. Um, so he was once speaking to widows of servicemen that were just killed in the line of duty. And he said, the day will come when speaking about your loved ones will bring more smiles to your face than tears to your eyes. That doesn't mean you moved on. That doesn't mean you forgot. You're not moving on. Your father is a part of your life every single day. But the experience is different. The pain, it's not a piercing pain anymore. You have the capacity to smile. You have the capacity to remember a funny story about him. So we think we're losing. By not feeling the pain. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu made it that with time, it becomes less painful. That doesn't mean you're forgetting. That doesn't mean you're moving on. It's just a different relationship now. Okay, I'm afraid I want to read this question, okay? Very powerful question over here. I lost my baby boy who never had a chance to come home from rehab hospital. Really hard to cope and I feel very alone. What are some ways to cope? Um, I'll share. <clears throat> Again, it's a very, very individualized question, one that could be beyond um, the, the scope of this, of this forum. And again, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, I think I'll bring out one point to validate something here. I remember I was once by a shiva called my wife uh, um, to a mother, a, a family member that had lost. This was the second child they lost and they were both infants. <clears throat> and my wife, when speaking to her, um, and she was, you know, she was very forthcoming with my wife. Most, pe most people didn't have what to say, what to share, because when you lose a child, an older child, you're saying stories about school, about accomplishments, right? <laughs> You have a little infant, right? What are you sharing that somehow can be of interest to, to others? You have a child that's in a facility. What are you sharing? And that isolation and loneliness is so overwhelming. And again, I'm not comparing one pain to another, but I'll, I'll never forget what my wife said there. My wife said, she said to her cousin and said, Rifki, those those midnight moments of how the how your baby looked at you and how he smiled at you and how he smelled and how you cuddled with him. Those are memories that you'll hold on to and never forget. There are so many little memories that you have with your child in the facility that's so, so hard to share with others. You can't just walk into a supermarket and speak about what that moment was like on a Sunday afternoon when you when you visited your child in the facility. No one will understand. So that isolation and loneliness is beyond anyone's comprehension. But know that there are memories that are so valuable to you and that are deeper than anything else. And make sure to cherish them. Make sure to share them with a spouse and to hold on to it because that's your child. Hi, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Um, I have a question um, that I had. Unfortunately, I had surgery last, last summer, the end of last summer. It was not for anything life-threatening or like that, but uh, I wanted to, I have a friend this year who is also going for a non-threatening life surgery. And I wanted to, you know, tell him that I didn't tell him last year. I wanted to tell him about it. 
that I also had it and the like, and to try to, but my mother um, tried telling me not to. She thought if I told him that in the future when I want to get married, it might, if he, if it accidentally gets, gets out, he tells someone, it might ruin the shit off because they might not understand fully or might think, oh, it's surgery. It must be something like serious and they might like ruin that kind of thing. So like, what exactly should I do in that kind of situation? I'm a scholar. <laughs> um, you know, there are many surgeries that are not life threatening. Um, there's a whole division uh, section in hospitals of of uh, surgeries that are. Uh, elective surgeries, not emergency surgeries. Uh, something that's done uh, very normally. So I, I, I think the first thing you have to realize, maybe your mother also doesn't realize this, perhaps, is that not every surgery uh, is, you know, is because somebody was deathly ill. I don't know what happened, uh, what your surgery was about, nor do, nor do you have to say anything to me now or what your friend's surgery is about, but the way how you're describing it, it's, it's an elective surgery. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be a life-threatening surgery. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a perfectly normal thing that someone will, you know, can play ball and uh, something happens to their leg. Uh, you, know, the, you know, sports medicine is not because of life-threatening, uh, you know, illnesses. It's because of, you know, during sports, they, we sometimes, um, uh, strain, uh, you know, something that needs to be corrected. So I think perhaps if you normalize it, maybe your mother will see it in a much different way. Mm -hmm. Would you say, would you say, Rabbi Scholar, that in your 35 years of high life line, you've seen the shift of how the community perceives illness in the family in terms of Shaduchim, and that it's a different community today than it was when you started? Oh, 100%. I, I was in Camp Simcha this past Shabbos, and I don't know, someone, they, were, they, they wanted to talk to me about the, how it was in the, in the beginning years. In the beginning years, it wasn't, so, um, it wasn't so popular to be a staff member in Camp Simcha. You didn't have 100 uh, applicants per job. Um, and it wasn't so common to send your children to acknowledge, you know, illness. There was a there, there was a time in the very beginning years we had to go door to door, literally, and knock on people's doors, and convince parents to send their children to our to camp to camp Simcha. A lot of parents would deny they even had a child that was ill. So illness was a, illness at that time was really sometimes that was very very hidden. Today we've made major 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 changes. Uh, Baruch Hashem, and people acknowledge it, and people aren't ashamed of it, and people are deal with it in all communities, in all types of, in, in, in all the from communities, from you know various different variations. So society has definitely become much more uh, accepting, and ain bias she ain shum Indian. You know, every everyone's home has something, and everyone realizes that. Thank you. Okay, let's go. Let's jump onto this live question. Is hi. that for, is that for me? Yep. Yeah. Hi. Um, um, I live in an out of town community, and um, my husband and I are very much involved in working with people. And unfortunately, um, besides all the good things that there are, obviously, as you guys know better than anyone, there's a lot of tragic situations. And as somebody who's very involved with people, and people come to us with their tsaris, um, you know, me personally being a fixer, somebody who likes to fix situations, there are many situations that can't be fixed. And I find it many times very hard and very difficult. For example, you know, you talk about Amuna, yes, and we all have Amuna, but there are situations, for example, where Alpi Teva, you know, there is no 
help. And the, obviously the Abish can always do a mess and we're aware of that. But there are many situations where you know you can't help the person. And it's very, very difficult because when you want to fix and you want to make it better and you know you can't necessarily, it's not in our hands. Sometimes I find it very difficult. It's, it's, it's a heavy burden to carry. And I was wondering if you have any kind of you know, advice for me, you know, I think I give people support. Yes, a lot of support, um, but it's hard for me because I want to fix it and I know I can't. Uh, let me just make a comment, uh, Rabbi Fried, then you can answer it. First of all, why, why do we perceive that fixing means doing what Hashem does? HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. There's a big difference between fixing things and helping things. There's a, there's a consequence. You know, Akash Baruch runs the world. And things happen. You know, a lot of things happen. Next week, you'll, you'll hear about Sadiq Viralov, Russia Kitovo. It's a, it's, a, it's a question that Moshe Rabbeinu had. <laughs> he couldn't find an answer to this one. A lot of tragic things that happen. Sure. Sit now with chairs, myself and Rabbi Fritz chair for a day and you, and, you, and you see all the tragic stuff that goes on with babies and young adults. It's pretty, pretty sad things. We can't fix things. We can help people. And that's, you and your husband are in a very, very important position because you can actually help someone get through the situation that they're in. And that's fixing it. That's fixing the moment. That's fixing the moment. That's real fixing. You're helping someone deal with today, now. You, you created the world. You fixed the world right then and there. Let me add. Let me, let me add. I, I hear you. Um, I hear you. You're right. I mean, obviously, we know it's not in our control. It's just, you know, it's difficult, you know, to watch somebody else suffer. It's very, very, very difficult. It's beyond, it's beyond difficult, and you're 100% right. Um, to, to, to elaborate a bit on, on Rebbe Scholar's point, right? We deal every single day with supporting families in situations that you can't change the reality. We're not neurosurgeons. And um, sadly, we're dealing with end of life situations. We can't take out brain tumors. We don't know how to, how to heal illness. We daven to Hashem, obviously for a foolish shalema. But within the challenges of every day um, that we can't fix, we somehow can find areas where we can support them. We, 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 we speak about this all the time when Bacharim are davening for a Rebbe that sadly has an incurable, um, that, has, that has an incurable disease, that the focus shouldn't just be on the ultimate refuah shlema, which we daven and we hope for, but there's on the today, there's meaning in today. I'll never forget the father who once shared at a high lifeline Shabbat tone. He says, I can't explain why my daughter just third, relapsed for the third time um, with a brain tumor. I can't find meaning in it. I hope for Fushalema, but we don't know what's going to be. And I can't explain to you why all of you are sitting here. But he said, I can find some sort of meaning within today without fixing the situation. He says, you know, we all struggle. This was his father's perspective, but it gives you a perspective. He says, you know, we have our midlife crises and we all struggle every single day. Um, what is it the Ratz and Hashem that Hashem wants of me to do today? Should I do this? Should I do that? He says, when my daughter has low platelets, I know that Hashem is talking to me at that moment and saying, Mayor, get into the car and drive the, sh drive the chop. I can't fix it. I can't heal my daughter. But that sense of I feel that Hashem is talking to me and I know my purpose gave him a sense of meaning. As a help agent that you are in your community, you can't fix, but to identify within everyday challenges some sort of meaning, 
like Rabbi Scala said, the light within the tunnel, not to get to the end of the tunnel, that can be done in the worst situations. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, you're on. Oh, that, that's me? That's okay. you. Yes, um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm from a small out of town community. I can hear I have a different accent. Um, what I'm actually wanting to present the, the perspective of someone who is the recipient of help and support from others. Um, and I struggle with this, and I'll tell you why, because um, people, when, when my circumstances changed and I was in need of help from other people, some, some people reached out to me. Unfortunately, my own family, my close family are not there for me. Um, and in the main, it's been very comforting to know people really care, especially because my family's not there for me. My issue is that sometimes I feel, and maybe it's just I'm extra sensitive, I feel that I may, they may be doing this because I'm, they want to be doing chesed. Although I do think that the people who reached out to me really do care about me. And this is maybe some work that I have to do. But I tell myself that all I have now in my, these circumstances is my dignity. And that I am a regular person like everyone else that difficult things have happened to. And this helps me hold my head high and interact with the world in the way that I feel comfortable with. My question is, do you have any ideas how I can deal with this? And how do I differentiate with people who are one who, I don't actually feel like I'm a chesed case, I'm not. Um, how do I differentiate between, between people who want to use me as a vehicle to do chesed or those who genuinely care about me? But I just want, the reason I'm actually becoming, you know, making this a public thing is because I want people to be aware of and be careful when they're doing chesed, helping someone, not to consider themselves superior to other the people who they're helping, because they're everyone really is one step away from something happening to them. And chasuchala, don't don't wash it on anybody else. And the other thing, also they should realize is I personally work very very hard to show up in the world that I'm okay, and that I'm a normal regular person, and that I'm not affected by my circumstances. But believe me, I am, and I don't want to be treated as rachmonis. I want to be treated as a regular person who had difficult things have happened to. I, I can't tell you um, how appreciative and I commend you for sharing that with us. I think you, under challenging circumstances, you articulated your feelings well, and it's definitely something um, that I would take with in my work on a daily basis to share your thoughts and how you feel about it. So I, I thank you for sharing that on a public forum. Um, I think someone like yourself can genuinely differentiate between those that care and those that are using you, so to speak, as a chesed project. And ultimately you're the one facing the challenges and thus are entitled to say who you're gonna accept help for and who not. And the third point I would say is that to maintain dignity is, as we said over from, you know, what Reb Chaim Shalevit says with Shlomo Amelach, make sure you maintain that makal, make sure that you have your areas that you're in control over and that you make the, the decision what those areas are and don't allow others to take that over. Yes. Well, actually, that's, a, that's a something that I, I have become aware of. That is something that I've given away too much power in my life. Yes. Um, and that's what I've been. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, here's um, another hard question that came in. There's, this person was just diagnosed with cancer, and they write, they have two younger kids. I feel not only embarrassed for myself that I'll be starting losing my hair and being weak, but at the same time, feel scared for my kids' embarrassment and not sure how to deal with it. The first thing the person needs to do is reach out to an organization that knows how to deal with this to be able to um, help her deal with her children and deal with herself. Um, 
and um, you know this this is very very critical because if if it's dealt with correctly, then you know then this situation becomes that much easier to cope with, um, and uh, it's very very difficult to learn these things on your own. When no one goes to school and you know and learns how to deal with cancer. Uh, when we get married, that's not part of the uh, preparation of marriage, how to deal with yourself or with uh, your kids with cancer. Um, so there are organizations, High Lifeline is definitely available, uh, to be able to uh, give them the, the proper hadrocha to be able to, uh, you know, have them cope. What would you tell somebody who doesn't want to feel like a nebuchadnezzar? So I will, I will add, again, reaching out, you know, just to, just to bring it a point, I always say, reaching out to organizations, you know, in a chesed case, sometimes getting friend, help from friends, friends and family, it's a chesed case. We're not bali chesedim, we're, we're professionals, paid professionals, that this is what we do, and there's a certain comfort in that that can be less you know, less threatening than to accept help from neighbors and communities, etc. But to give two, and again, every case is specific, but to give two generic, you know, um, hadrachas, so to speak, on that points is to say, to share age-appropriate information with children doesn't increase fear, it minimizes fear. It builds trust, it builds um, reassurance, gives them a sense of control over their environment. That's point number one. Point number two is, yes, it's challenging for children, but as Rabbi Scholar can attest for doing this for years, children are very resilient. Children are very <coughs> resilient. Doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. It will be challenging, but children are resilient and can cope without professional intervention if there is an open, honest, and reassuring environment at home, your children are going to be okay. Okay doesn't mean that there isn't going to be pain and there aren't going to be challenges, but children are resilient and can even grow from situations and challenges like this. That doesn't mean that there aren't challenges, but as long as you're sharing age-appropriate information, reaching out for guidance if needed, know that your children are going to be resilient and can deal with challenging information like this. Let's go to a live question here. Hold on one second, let's come meet them. Okay, I'm here. Hi, thank you so much. Um, talking from personal experience, when a child has cancer, there's a lot of sort of pump and ceremony, putting them on a pedestal, making them into a superhero. Um, and that's all to take away from the pain, the emotional and physical pain that they're going through to keep them busy and occupied or whatever the reason is that it's needed. At the same time, when the child eventually hopefully recovers, um, it's really hard for them to get back to the quote unquote normal life. And then they can't relate to people their own age. They have older friends from volunteers and counselors that are older friends. And how can we make that balance of they're going through a hard time yet they're still just kids and need to relate to kids their own age. Firstly, um, there are two parts to any life-threatening illness. There is the part where the family and the child is fighting the illness. That's part one. And then there's part two is when the illness Baruch Hashem is cured, then getting things back to quote unquote normal and dealing with the consequences of that difficult battle. So both things emotionally are, 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 are equally important. So that's a that's something that's um, something that needs to be recognized. That you know, after all, treatments stop, in Baruch Hashem, uh, where we get we ring the bell. Um, there's still residual effects that um, that have to be dealt with. Um, 
and a child that goes through such a difficult situation is a different child. Doesn't mean that they are any worse, chas v'shalom, they're probably better, but it's a, it's a difficult child. It's, it's a different child. They've seen things that most children their age have never seen. Illness, death, the inside of a hospital. They, uh, you know, they've seen a lot of things that uh, would be traumatized to someone that's double their age. So we recognize that post the treatment, there is issues and situations that I think we can reach out to those that are a little bit, uh, perhaps have more experience uh, to professionals, whether it's High Lifeline, whether it's others, to be able to help the family get through that next step. But Fried, I'm sure you can add more to this. No, I, I think, I think Rabbi Scala, you brought up a, an extremely valuable point, which is there's a stage of illness and then there is, um, you know, the post stage, um, post chemo. Not even talking about the physical implications of that, which we know the concept of a chemo brain, et cetera. But we definitely know that there are kids that need Camp Simcha sometimes a year or two years later. Um, maybe even more than during treatment. Um, we know for parents, sometimes post-treatment can be more challenging than during treatment. Having said that, um, you know, the mother's question was a very powerful one, which is she understood that there needed to be that extra attention, that, you know, to balance that pain and suffering with so many goodies, that Disney response, right? At what point? Do we stop that at what point, right? And I think that, you know, to address it to you directly to the mother, which is to say, you're the most important, you know, decision maker here, right? Ultimately, you know your child best. You're the best mother. You knew your child before illness. You knew him during illness. You understand that there's still emotional consequences, like Rabbi Scholar said, that can last post illness, but ultimately, you know at what point you have to start, so to speak, graduating a child out. And obviously, if you need the help of a professional, there's always those that you can discuss it with to balance it off. But ultimately, you're the mother that knows it best. Okay. A few more questions I want to cover. Okay, there's important topics, and then we'll try to go to closing. Okay, we're good with time, Reverend Fried. Reverend Scott, we're good. <laughs> that, that's a very difficult question for those of us that wake up very early in the morning <laughs> okay since I lost my child my friends and neighbors seem to stay away from me since they are not comfortable around me when they are talking about their kids or family vacations I come near them and they slowly say, quiet say that they, they slow it down and they say oh nice to see you I gotta go now it's making me feel why am I losing everything how do I show people that I want to be treated like just a regular, normal person. I'll never forget, Oshi. Um, I was leading a group at a High Lifeline bereavement retreat up in Camp Simcha. Me, you're in? Uh, um, years ago. And a mother shared this story. She said, she said, when I, when I, when I, when I, when people come over to the house and, um, and albums are put out and we're sharing albums and then they get to the page where it's my it's my son that was nifter they try to subtly just move over the page skip it go to the next it feels like i'm losing my child again you know you come to the supermarket and you see people just going to the other aisle because they don't want to see me so as a typical therapist instead of giving an answer i said so what do you do um because i didn't have the answer <laughs> Um, and she said, you know, what I learned over time is that I, there's no way to prepare the world how to react to families that lost children. You don't live in a world saying, I want to know what to do when my neighbor loses a child. That's not how we live life. We prepare the world to say, what do we do when a neighbor makes a simcha? Oh, I got to go buy a scotch. I got to go. I got to give a cake. That's how we live life. She said, sadly, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave this to me. I didn't choose it. But ultimately, it's on me. And she shared with the other mothers. She said, 
I, I, I go back to the page and say, this is my son, let me share a story with you. And once she does that, it makes it so much easier for others to come back next time and go back and say, let's hear another story. Or I heard a story about your son. There is no way to educate the world, how to deal with tragedies that all of us hope will never happen to us or to any we know. This was from a mother who shared that at a high lifeline, Reem and Shabbaton. Wow. Okay. Let's jump on this one. Um, it's really two separate questions, but I'm going to read them both. Okay, Rabbi Freeth, Rabbi Scala, with me? Here we go. I'm going to give Rabbi Scala the tougher one. You give me the other one. No, no, I, I got the good ones for Rabbi Scala. Don't worry, the, the tough ones I got for him. <laughs> two questions, really just two different angles, but let, let's try to, I think we can tackle them together. <clears throat> my father died seven years ago. My mother has always been, since then, has been depressed and not getting out of bed. She basically fell into a state of being lost and completely incapable of anything. I've been doing all the stuff for her, taking care of everything and shopping for her. But how could I help her move on or maybe even get remarried? She's only 57 years old. There's another question. I lost my wife a few years ago and I'm just still processing it. I'm getting comments from my kids and friends going to go to therapy, get remarried, move on already. I'm making it worse. I'm just sitting in it and they're not understanding me. How could I explain them just to leave me alone and let me grieve? I'll address initially, or basically you'll take, you'll take over from there. I think there's definitely parts to this question that, like I said, it's very individualized. That's beyond the scope of this specific um, group. But I think that, again, I, I think the use the words move on should never be used. <laughs> Don't move on. Um, my, my wife lost her father at a young age. Um, has three brothers that one of them, I once asked them by the yard side, you know, you must be thinking about your brother. He says, he looked at me and says, really, you may work in high lifeline, but you don't know what it's like. There's never been a day that passed that we didn't think about our brother. And that includes Purim, Tisha B'Av, Yom Kippur. There's no such a thing. There's, there's no moving on. Pain gets less. The, the relationship gets transitioned, um, but there's no moving on. There is, you know, we can look in all the literature in the world and talk about timetable for grief and what their exact timing is. And again, that's very individualized and every person is different. You know, if you look at Rabbeinu Avram and Aram, if you look at the Igris Rambam, Rabbeinu Avram and Rambam, which he describes, um, the Rambam talks about the loss of his brother and he talks about it's eight years later. It's eight years later and he's still struggling with it. So who's someone to say, move on, not move on. I think that the best way you can help somebody is by taking away the words moving on, acknowledging that we can't imagine, but within the reality that it is, can we help in one of this, this ways, right? Depression, grief is not depression. Depression is you're facing challenges, mundane challenges that everybody faces and your reaction is different. Grief is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. Rabbi Scholar? Um, just to expand upon that, every, every individual deals with their situation differently. Um, I, I, I don't believe that the pain gets less. I believe we get stronger. Uh, when someone loses someone that's that dear to them, a spouse, a child, the pain never gets less we get stronger, we're able to carry the package better. Moving on doesn't mean you, you, you moving on doesn't necessarily mean you, you leave the package behind. Moving on is, a, is in, the, in the traditional sense, means that you just leave it there and move on. Moving on in grief means you have the package with you and now we're gonna take the next step to life. It's also very individualized. People deal with things differently. There's certain people that need to walk out of this, you know, when they're ready. Then you have extreme behaviors like staying in bed and not doing anything. That's an extreme behavior. That's depression that needs some real professional help. That's not grief. That's depression. And that needs to be helped. 
perhaps the person needs to go see a doctor, medication, some other things. 58-year-old woman that went through a difficult situation losing a spouse is very difficult, but that's not an excuse to be in bed a whole day and be non-functioning. Uh, that's, that's excessive behavior that needs to be addressed. So grief is individual, very individualized. A person has to move, move forward when they're ready, when they're strong enough to be able to carry the package and enter a new phase of life. You never forget about your spouse. You never forget about your child. You just get strong enough to live with the loss of it. Second marriages are sometimes the most complicated things in the world. You never, re, you a, a spouse doesn't replace a grand, doesn't become the new grandmother. You don't become the new bubby. You don't become the new, the new mommy. People make critical errors like that. But a person has a right to move on. A person has a right to take, you know, go on to the next step of their life, not forgetting about the previous life. So it's individualized. Baruch gives us the, the, the time gives us the kayak to carry this burden. But all of these, that's normal. That's a normal grief reaction. Staying in bed a whole day is is uh, is depression. And that needs to be addressed by a by a professional. Okay. So we had tragedies by Kalal Yisrael. For example, when we heard um, the story in Miran, or we hear children dying, or any of the sad stories that happen in our communities, what is the job of someone who hasn't been personally affected, but we're heartbroken to hear what's going on? What's the way that we should deal with what we hear, all the stories that we hear? What you're asking is probably the most important question in, in, the, in for the three weeks, and for that matter, that the, uh, in the Golos. You know, Shituf B'Tzar and Yisrael, participating in the Tzar of Kali Yisrael doesn't mean sitting shiva, but it means it has, it has to have some type of a, an effect upon us. It, it, we just can't hear about 24 people dying and just go on with our barbecue for the day. We just can't hear about tragedies that are going on uh, and, and, and just not stopping to reflect on it. Mitzvah sanashim in limuda, the Pasuk says, that's, 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 that's a very difficult thing. And it's not just in mitzvahs, it's in, just in, in reactions. So, you know, a person he has to have some type of reflection on this. And even if the reflection is just a, an extra... Hargasha, some feeling in, in davening, you know, praying for Mashiach, or al nisech shabachal yom yimano, appreciating what we have. Something positive, not necessarily something negative. That's very, very important. We just can't, it just can't become another news item. I think many struggle, many struggle because today with the media, it's like, yeah, people are, it's wherever you go. And people don't know what to do. And, and, and people become very immune to it and become very, uh, and that's quite unfortunate. But that, I think that's a, that's a real, it's a real struggle. I think there is no, there is no simple antibiotic for this. I think we as individuals, as responsible Eden, need to reflect upon this, uh, especially during the three weeks, especially during the nine days, especially on Tisha B'Av. We need to reflect on this. Now, I'm not saying a person should reflect on this every day of their life and stop what they're doing and, and get into a sense of depression. But on the days that are appropriate for this, um, like Tisha B'Av, that's a time you really should reflect on the Maron. You know, reflect on, on the incredible, difficult service that are going on in the Klal Yisro. The tragedies. The pain, the difficulties. It's not political when, uh, you know, when you feel a sense of remorse for someone that was killed by a terrorist. It's one of our brothers, one of our sisters. 
again, it's not a, it's a person's a person. You can't do it every day, but there are days that are, that that that, the, that the, our calendar allows us to do it. And I think we have to personalize Tisha B'Av. We can't just generalize Tisha B'Av. We have to personalize it to the individual in the individual tragedies that are that are happening and have happened. Whether it's the young woman that was diagnosed with ALS, whether it's the three-year-old baby that died in the car because uh, the father, whatever, just ran out of the car in the and it was a uh, hundred degree weather, or whether it was Marone, or whether it's who knows how many other things that have happened over the course of the year that have been so devastating. We need to do this. At every at any level, at any level. Mm-hmm. We can't we, we can't allow ourselves to get in to a situation where we don't feel anymore. Klai Yisrael is all about Lev. Do you want to jump in on this one or ready for the next one? Two more questions. Scholar, Rebbe, scholar said, I have nothing to add. Said it all. Okay. Somebody texted me this. I'm going to read this with another question. This podcast was beautiful. I really love to join High Life on helping relieve the pain of families, individuals, have experience in counseling, teens, adults. This person was saying how move shoes by the Gosha, but this is a question, you know, I personally love helping people and love doing chesed. How can I make a difference and help people? I don't have the money to write a big check, but I, but I want to, and I want to feel good helping people. What could I do? There's organizations, there's organizations like High Lifeline and numerous, numerous others. Klal Yisrael is just saturated, Baruch Hashem, with so many maizdes a chesed, and I can tell you, as a Rizkala said, as much as there is Waiting list for Kem Simcha, everybody needs more volunteers. And there is little areas that you can do, if it's cooking, if it's rides, if it's a big sister, if it's a big brother, if it's a hospital volunteer, hopefully, as the hospitals open up, there's for everybody, there's opportunities. And there is so many different organizations. The main thing is get involved. Because every person that gets involved, not only are they doing chesed, but they're, they're, they're paying it forward and making sure that others are going to do chesed as well. Just get involved. Pick up the phone, identify a need, pick an organization, and just do a little thing. Correct. Maskin? 100%. Okay. Last question before we go to closing. You ready? For both Rabbi Scholar and Rabbi Fritz. Here we go. I know Rabbi Fried and Rabbi Scholar, after all the tragedies you have seen and been through and see things that most people rather not even think about, how do you cope with such strategies and does it affect your moon and belief in Hashem at all? Who goes first? Uh, Go ahead, Rabbi Fried. Um, I, I, think, I think as follows. Um, you know, there's no question that in literally over a generation of doing this myself, I've seen unspeakable tragedy firsthand. The day that I become desensitized and can't feel the pain that I felt in August 2001 when I walked into my first hospital room in CHOP is the day I hang up my skates the day I give it up. The number one thing you have is your heart as a yid to feel with another yid's pain. Does it get hard? Of course. Are there moments where you just don't want to go to work and don't want to go to a hospital and don't want to get the next phone call? Of course. If you didn't have that, then again, it's time to leave. Um, I think it's the acknowledgement of how painful it is and allowing time for yourself and knowing it's okay and not feeling guilty by removing yourself. It's connecting with family um, in the mundane, simplistic things of life, doing homework with your kids, spending time with your family that really puts life into perspective sometimes 
we live in this world and we think everything is just illness and tragedy and just bringing it down um, to the simplicity of life is a way of how you cope. And in terms of if it affects Amuna and Betachen, again, you know, to the Kotzka Gazak, the Kenish Gleiben, you know, I can't, I can't believe in a God that he does. There's no way to understand any given day in this world of high lifeline to imagine Sadi Virali, Russia, Vitavli, little kids suffering. It's impossible to understand it. But do I get this Chazik from Amuna and Betachem by seeing what Kali Yisrael does in response to pain and suffering that doesn't make sense? That builds my Amuna and Betachem. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his, and, 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 and his Torah and his Amma Nifcha, the Jewish people. I will tell you, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, it's been a privilege, you know. It's been a privilege, and as Rafid said, uh, I believe how I find really changed the world and how the world looks at Srochim, um, how to do it, what could be done. But the truth, and the truth of the matter is, over the course of the past 35 years, We've dealt with some really nasty things. Fires, killings, accidents, who knows how many thousands of illnesses, who knows how many thousands of deaths, untimely deaths. I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions. I asked the biggest G'dayli Yisrael if I'm allowed to make that statement, and they said, Ein habay a person has to ask questions. And I, but I, and I know, the answers are upstairs. I have a lot of questions. I never question. There's a big difference between the two. A person wants to know. There are a lot of... Re- seemingly unfair things. But we never question HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I tell you, I was, um, I was walking to the office the other day, uh, last week, and um, walking down 6th Avenue in the Manhattan, and I had the right of way, the, the, the green light. So I, I walked from, 30, from 32nd Street to 31st Street. And 6th Avenue goes the other way, goes southbound. So the car also had a green light. And the car turned into the, wa- in, in, into the pedestrian walkway, hit me. And uh, I flew, I needed a couple of stitches. And, you know, I kind of, I, I felt a little bit like it was on the other side of the game, you know. You know? And I said to myself after I, uh, you know, came back to the office, whatever. I said to myself, like, what is all this? You know. And I said, yeah, I said, perhaps, you know, Akarish Baruch was sending me a message that I should appreciate the moving my hands. And I should appreciate being able to walk. One of the ways so I cope with the difficulties of what I have to deal with is I look at the brachis on the sechish of Yemimono. The, the miracles and the brachas that HaKadosh Baruch has given myself and our family. I f- try to focus in on that. So, you know something? It affects you. There are questions. We know never to question, and we know there are answers, and we're going to get the answers one day, or maybe we're, we're going to understand there was never a question. And to understand the the you know the brachas of, the, uh, of what Hakadosh Baruch Hu gives us, and I think that's a that's a really important thing of how I cope. And of course, you know there are I'm privileged to be close to Gedolim and um, you know people that I, mean, I also have a shoulder to cry in sometimes. Uh, that's a very very important thing. And um, 
And that's how you make it through. So. Okay, let's go to closing. Rabbi Fried, you're going to go first. Rabbi Scholar, you're going to go second, okay? Again, a gracious Shkoyach for Rabbi Scholar and Rabbi Fried for coming in tonight. Rabbi Mechazek, tremendous, tremendous shir. Was, Rabbi Fried, the, the energy was like murder. Unbelievable. And uh, Shkoyach for coming again uh, tonight. Everybody's here the first time, every 9.30, every Sunday night. We have a different shir, different topics. And next Sunday, we'll have the Shkosta of Rabbi Breitowitz, Mars Mecher, to capitalize on what we spoke about, Tzadik Veraloi. Right, understanding the story of Eve, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do the righteous suffer? Please join. Should be a Mayurdik program. Rabbi Radowitz is next level. And uh, please join. Again, everything is recorded. Mention will be on menachemberfel.com. If anybody has any questions or anything, please email coachmenachem at gmail.com. If anybody has questions for Rabbi Fried or Rabbi Scholar, send us. We'll forward it to them. Um, again, tonight's share is share 110. If anyone wants to listen to it on the phone, the number is 848 grow channel will be available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, Call of every everywhere and everywhere. Okay. Um, again, thank you to the advertising sponsors, Lakewood Scoop, Rabbi Yenid Chazak, Ellie and Ariel from Five Town Central, Kyla Kaufman, Shul Summer from JCN, and Rabbi Fried and Rabbi Scala. It was a very good share tonight. I appreciate it. I was moved. Rabbi Fried, you can go first. Uh, Menachem, Coach Menachem, let's go wrap it up. Thank you, Rabbi Scala. Thank you, Rabbi Fried. Like we heard, yes, Baruch Hashem. Again, the topic that we discussed tonight and what we're talking about is, is it's not easy. And those who are going through this, you know, sometimes it looks like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. And like we heard, sometimes we could bring some candles. We're not sure how. And it's, it's, a, it's a heavy discussion. And hopefully we're able to pick up some, some um, tips but uh, like we heard before, the, our, our human brain needs to make sense of what's going on. And um, that's why sometimes it's hard. We try to put it into a box, what's going on, well, how did it happen? And when, and when it happens to a neighbor or somebody, we need to figure it out. But we have to understand that sometimes we go through a situation that just we can't understand. And I like to quote to Rabbi Waiwai, he says, don't try to wrap your brain around it. Don't try to figure it out. Sometimes we have situations in life which we don't understand. And it's uncomfortable to sit there, whether it's for yourself or with uh, somebody else. But that's what we heard tonight. You know, it's, it's being there with them in that space, in that uncomfortability and being able to breathe. That's it. Not always is there something to say. So thank you very much for being mechazik. And again, Hashem should help that, you know, it should close down. <laughs> the organization should close down. But for those who, um, you know, who would like to volunteer and to help, there's always a need. And you're there in the front lines. So thank you very much. And in Mitzvah Hashem, we should be zoifa to Binyan Beis Hamikdash. I just want to mention one thing before free goes. Obviously, High Life, well, you know, they have their, their annual raise. It, you know, this week I think they have the liquid event. Everybody could be mishtatav, obviously. It's a very uh, worthwhile tzedakah, and it's an amazing organization, as we know. Anybody who can't give, every free said, just jump in, join, make a need. But please be part of it. Be part of it in any way you could. Every free, wrap it up. Give the oil a uh, take home material. Um, first of all, um, Ushi Menachem, thank you so much for the opportunity um, that you gave myself and Rabbi Scholar tonight, as well as I would like to thank the audience. Um, I always say that ultimately it's not the schooling that I learned all the years, it's rather what I learned from the families that I've helped. So many of you have shared personal stories tonight, and I've learned so much from all of you tonight, so thank you. Is, you know, to say my final thought or takeaway message, you know, I started out in my opening message talking about that the most overwhelming feeling when someone's dealing with illness or challenges is that of isolation and loneliness. And my takeaway message is that ultimately we have to make sure that people are not alone, that we're there with them, and we can't turn our back. The Bali Musar say that. It says that Miriam, when she became a Mitzras, Klal Yisrael waited for her seven days um, because she waited to see 
when Moshe Rabbeinu was in a basket floating in the sea. She waited to see Das Maya Asalai, what will happen to him. Therefore, she was Zaycha that Klal Yisrael waited for her for seven days. The question that as everyone asks is, she waited to see maybe a minute, two minutes, a half hour, an hour for that 600,000 people on a trajectory into the land in Deretz Yisrael. They had to wait seven days. Why was she Zaycha for that? So the Balimusas say that seemingly there was pain and suffering, that there was nothing to be done. There was a child floating helplessly in the depth of sea. But she couldn't turn her back. She couldn't walk away. And for that message of chesed and what a yid is, for that Klal Yisrael waited seven days. Every day, my friends, we face others that face challenges. And a lot of times we feel there's nothing we can do about it. The least we can do is to stand there and not walk away and not turn our back. If we could just be there with another person, Sar, for a moment, all of us collectively, hopefully, will be Zaycher Merz Hashem to be as Mashiach sooner rather than later. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Rabbi Scott, before you go, I want to ask you a question. Now that we finished the shear, is it a shear or a show? I want you to pass him. <laughs> I gave up the Rabbanas a while ago. <laughs> it's definitely a, a tremendous opportunity, and it's quite impressive that so many people are on the show and uh, interactive and questions it's really a, it's really it's really very inspiring for myself uh, to be privileged to be part of this and perhaps the one message that I just want to leave everyone uh, is to just echo the words of the time of the Vara in Perik Aleph where the time of the Vara comments on Chazal that say the Gmaran Shu is called Yisrael our Ravenzel is a Every yid is responsible for one another. So the term of the verse says, "Bnei shamamish yesh b'chol echad chelik aver mechavera." That every yid is literally part and parcel of the other Jew. He goes to the even to the extent of one Jew sins, the other Jew is feeling it also. This, there's a sense of responsibility that we have that we need. To recognize the Klal Yisrael is not made up of organizations. The Klal Yisrael is made up of individuals that feel a deep sense of responsibility. Everyone needs to be a giver. Some people can give money, some people can give time, some people can give emotion, some people can give tefillah, some people can give inspiration, but everyone needs to be a giver. This is the message that we have to internalize in ourselves. This is the message that we have to give our children and our grandchildren that the, what the, the ultimate goal of life is to be a giver. That's who we are. That's what a yid is all about. That's our DNA and that's the goal. So if we can take that home, that each and every one of us has the capability of giving and making a difference, then we're going to make a huge difference. And we're going to light a lot of candles in a lot of people's tunnels. We're going to have the ultimate end of the tunnel. And this year, Tisha B'Av will become a Yom Tif. We'll be able to dance together. Amen. for coming tonight. And I'm sure we'll see everybody next week with Robert Brightwood's Mitchell. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.